machine learning lecture number five. Here is where we are in the progress of the course. We began in lecture one to discover that probability measures are a way to encode uncertainty in reasoning. They allow an extension of propositional logic. Lecture two showed us that this process can be computationally very challenging unless we use structural prior information about the decoupling or the conditional decoupling of the inference process when certain variables are available. In lecture three, we saw that this logic can be extended to continuous variables to reason about quantities that, have, that are uh, lengths and rates and, and uh, other real variables. In the last lecture, we uh, began to think about how to actually implement probabilistic reasoning in practice. This is primarily a computational issue, and we saw that um, the key operation to be done in this kind of process is integration, which um, shows up in various forms to compute various quantities. Usually these quantities are a form of expectation um, of some function f. Here we go. That function might well be the unit function, then we are computing a normalization constant. It could also be the expectation of a likelihood, then it's the evidence. It could be the expectation of the linear function, then it's the mean of this distribution. Or the expectation of any other polynomial of x, then it's a moment of this distribution. These integrals can be very hard if the distribution is complicated. And one generic, though not necessarily the perfect or best way to compute these integrals in practice, is to draw random samples from the distribution defined by the probability density function p, if it exists, and then sum up evaluations of the function f at these drawn variables, um, and normalize by the number of samples. This gives a random number known as the Monte Carlo estimator, which we showed last time to be an unbiased estimator, whose variance drops um, with a rate that is proportional to the inverse number of samples, which means that the expected error, which is the square root of the variance, drops like one over the square root of the number of samples. We saw that this is in some sense a good rate, because actually there is no better rate for unbiased estimators, and also it means that after a relatively small number of samples, we get a relatively good ballpark estimate for the value of the number we're trying to compute. It's not a precise way to compute, or not an efficient way to compute a precise estimate because it takes an extremely large, square large number of samples to drop the error to a very small value. We uh, also saw, though, that um, as nice as this idea is, there is a challenge here that even though the process that I've written down here is actually a relatively simple uh, computation, it sort of hides the computational issue that we need to draw random numbers from the distribution in the first place. And this drawing random numbers operation can actually be quite challenging. We saw that for basic analytic distributions, we can do this using the definition of a random variable by drawing from a general, sorry, from a typically uniform or base measure uh, probability distribution using a random number generator and then pushing these, like mapping these random samples through a nonlinear function such that their derived density or measure is the one that we're looking for. However, this requires us to know a lot and actually find this correct trans translation, transformation. If we don't have that, then we need to use a more generic algorithm. And um, so uh, we spoke about this last time, just a, a quick recap. Doing so can be hard for various reasons. We found out that we can fix a few of these issues. One issue is that typically, for example, in Bayesian inference, we don't have access to the probability density function we try to draw from, only to an unnormalized version of it, because we might have prior likelihood, but the evidence is unknown, being an integral itself. Um, that is something that we might be able to fix by using an algorithm that can deal with this non-normalized property. But there is a larger problem, which is that doing so typically requires a kind of global description of the problem. So we saw some simple algorithms which can be used for low-dimensional, typically one-dimensional problems, reasonably efficiently if you know a little bit, 
For example, rejection sampling allows us, or is based on the idea of let's just construct a probability distribution that scaled in the right way, puts an upper bound onto the thing we're trying to draw from, the PEF we try to draw from, then draw samples, reject all the ones that are not in the sort of covered by this area under the curve, those are actually samples, but um, they are IID samples from the true black distribution. But we saw that um, the rejection rate of this process can be quite bad even in the one dimensional case. I mean, here the rejection rate is like one half roughly, right? So we lose about half of our samples. In multi multiple dimensions, the problem can be much harder. And um, so I gave you a simple example constructed or uh, taken from uh, the book by David Fakai, showing that even for extremely simple base cases where we have a very good fit in some sense for the distribution we're trying to sample from, the rejection rate can be exponentially high in the dimensionality of the problem. At the very end of the lecture, we also saw that you might come up with sort of, uh, in some sense, naive ways of easing this problem. One of them is important sampling, which is based on the idea not to reject samples outright, but to weigh every single sample with essentially its rejection probability. That allows you to keep all of the samples around, so you don't have to throw them all away. But really, this is essentially just a smooth version of rejection sampling, and it has all the same problems. In particular, it has maybe even an additional problem, which is that because you don't reject samples, you don't really notice as much how uh, little information an individual sample produces, so I constructed this perhaps a little bit um, overloaded plot that shows that if you use a, a, a probability distribution like this red curve, which doesn't have as much mass, which has a very strongly suppressed probability density at the regions that, uh, where the target distribution has non-trivial density, then these uh, samples from the importance way, uh, import, sorry, importance sampling can have extremely high weights in these regions and these weights happen very rarely so the distribution has a very high variance but you will, it actually can take quite a long time for you to notice or even infinitely long time for you to notice that this variance is very high because these extremely high value high weight samples are drawn extremely rarely so these methods which are relatively old are not a good way to construct general Al Monte Carlo algorithms, essentially, or to, gen to construct general samples from high-dimensional, non-trivial distributions. So what I want to do in today's lecture is to give you a brief intro to some of um, the Monte Carlo methods that you might call state-of-the-art, that are actually used in software packages that are currently used in machine learning to do probabilistic inference. I should maybe say that we're doing this at this point in the course which is a little bit early, maybe, to talk about these uh, somewhat low-level computational issues. The reason I do it, do it at, at this point is that uh, for you to do the exercises that go alongside this course, you need some, something in your toolbox that allows you to actually do some implementation. So if you don't talk about any algorithms for the first few weeks, then you don't really have the, you know, the, the, the tools at hand to uh, solve the tasks that we have on the exercise. So if some of the, like I'm going to be forced to use a few concepts that are not particularly hard, but which um, come maybe a little bit early in this course, and I will brush over them a little bit, not because they're not important, or not because I assume that you know them, but because we will talk about them again as we move forward in the course. Sometimes it can actually be helpful to talk, to use concepts uh, in a more intuitive fashion early on in the course so that your brain already adapts to the use of these words and then when they finally show up in the course you actually get to understand them more precisely because you know that they are already important. Okay, so the methods uh, we're going to be talking about are methods that address these issues that we've just identified with low-level Monte Carlo methods like rejection sampling and important sampling and something you might call exact Monte Carlo, which means drawing from a base measure and then transforming to a nonlinear distribution that draws directly from the measure you want to draw from. Just to summarize, these methods are 
not particular, like, well, they're actually challenging to design because Monte Carlo methods are integration methods, and integration is hard. And especially it's hard in high dimensions. So practical Monte Carlo methods need to be able to deal with the fact that trivial distributions contain integrals that we don't know, so they have to be scaled by, that to be able to, to, to work with distributions that are scaled by unknown constant. And they have to address a more challenging issue, which is that all the methods we spoke about so far are in some sense global. So the proposal distribution in importance or rejection sampling have to be designed such that they are a relatively good model for the distribution we're trying to draw from everywhere. They don't have to be perfect because the algorithms take care of the mismatches by re-weighting or by rejecting, but they still have to actually dis like cover the entire measure and put like in particular, they have to put mass wherever the measure we want to draw from has mass, but also they shouldn't put too little mass where our target measure has high, has high mass, and also not too high mass into regions where our target measure has low mass, because otherwise we're going to reject a lot of samples, or we have to wait for a very long time to get accepted samples. The class of methods that addresses this issue, and which is like contains among its members the state of the art in um, sampling in Monte Carlo methods is called Markov chain Monte Carlo, or usually abbreviated as MCMC. And it's based on a very intriguing idea, which can be a little bit tricky to understand at first. And it's based on the idea that instead of constructing IID samples, from the target distribution directly in a complicated co um, computation, maybe we can get away by not producing IID samples, but producing a sequence of conditionally dependent samples, such that over time, when we take these samples afterwards and maybe scramble them, we can actually think of them as IID samples. Here is how this works. So for that, we first need to define a concept, which will actually be important at a later point in the lecture as well for real applications. It's a very basic notion called a Markov chain. This goes back to uh, a Russian mathematician who is actually a contemporary of um, Andrei Konmolorov and uh, wrote a text that was actually originally published only in Russian and took a bit of time. Actually, Konmolorov helped pop popularize, uh, popularize it. I don't know. Um, um, that is a very specific kind of conditional independence that is not quite independence but almost. And it corresponds to this kind of graphical model. So a sequence of, pro of uh, um, random numbers that are distributed jointly such that the conditional distribution for one variable in this chain, given all its precursors, is actually equal to the probability distribution for that one variable given its immediate precursor. So what that means is, and you can already read this off from this graph if you've watched lecture two, that every single variable is independent of all the previous variables given the immediate predecessor variable. The natural intuition that is implied by this picture is that of a time series, right? As a memoryless time sequence process that just knows where it's currently at, it doesn't care about where it came from, and just moves forward. These Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, so Monte Carlo methods that are based on this structure called the Markov chain, iteratively draw samples such that they produce a kind of dynamic process that moves around the uh, support of our probability measure, such that over time, this, this chain, if you take all its elements and scramble them uh, randomly, are actually, at least asymptotically, independent draws from the target measure. How this actually works and why this is the case, we now have to see by constructing one of these algorithms. And we're going to construct initially the most basic one, which is maybe the original MCMC method, and then we'll find problems with it and iteratively fix them in several iterations from one step to the next. And eventually, at the end of this lecture, we will reach a relatively complicated algorithm that is actually arguably state of the art, or at least very close to state of the art. It's not the only state of the art algorithm. There are several such Markov chain Monte Carlo methods currently in use, 
and the picture of which of them is best for the particular setting is constantly changing at this point while I'm recording this lecture, but we will reach one algorithm at least that you can think of as very close to the state of the art, even though it's already a, a single digit number of years old. Okay, but let's begin with a really old algorithm, one that goes back to um, about half a century, again to this bunch of uh, um, uh, nuclear physicists, if you like, working on the Manhattan Project in uh, the, during the, the end of the Second World War and the, the, the Cold War. And it's an algorithm that um, I'll introduce in the next slide. It's called Metropolis Hastings, and it's based on the following intuition. So let's first think about a setting in which we don't want to draw from a distribution. We just want to find the maximum of a probability density function. So that's an optimization problem. Optimization is actually easier than integration because we're just trying to find one point rather than a distribution of points. We could do that using the following optimization algorithm, which you might call a stochastic optimization algorithm. It's not a great optimization method. I don't recommend that you build your optimizer that way, but it helps for intuition for what we're trying to do. So let's say we're, going, we're trying to build our sequence, our Markov chain of um, of uh, random numbers, and let's say we want this Markov chain to converge to the maximum, at least a local maximum, of the target distribution P. So we have a current estimate XT, and we're going to use something which we'll call a proposal distribution, which I'll call Q. Q is not the thing we're trying to draw from, we're trying to draw from P build, or from P edge, a normalized version of P build. So, um, that probability distribution can be, well, more or less anything. Let's imagine that it's a distribution that typically we will need to have um, at least uh, locally is a relatively sort of smoothness property and whenever you saw it, see a, 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 a term in the equations I am going to introduce that contains Q, typically in a numerator and a denominator, just assume that that quantity exists. So that's the kind of level of regularity we need from Q. What we're going to do is, we're currently at some stage in our Markov chain, XT, and we're going to use this proposal distribution to produce a random um, number that is distributed according to Q. Q might depend on where we currently are, given this. So it might, for example, be a distribution that is centered at XT, around XT, and produces a sample at that point. Then we evaluate the ratio between the value of our target density at the proposed point and where we currently are. If that number is larger than zero, that means that P tilde at the, at the sample point it has a higher value than where we currently are. Because we are currently trying to optimize, that's a good thing. So we're just going to step there. We will call this accepting this point, and we will add it to our Markov chain as the next step. If that's not the case, so if the point we've just tested is below the point we're currently at, on uh, the value of P at that point is below the one we're currently at, then we just don't do anything. We just add the, like we take a step in the Markov chain in time, basically, and we just keep it where it's currently at. So we add the next step. Um, the next location of x to where we're currently at. Or xt plus 1 is equal to xt. So, there we go. Okay, so this process evidently will asymptotically get us to a point that is a local maximum, assuming that q has, um, is sort of smooth and has sufficient support around all the states we're currently in. And um, um, we're not going to show that, but I guess it's intuitive, assuming that Q is sufficiently regular. Now, we don't want to have an algorithm that only moves to the maximum and then gets stuck there. We want to have an algorithm which asymptotically produces draws that actually move around in the entire space. We do want something similar to optimization, though, which is that regions that have high P, high probability density, should be visited more often. So it should be more likely to, to, stay, to step to a point that has a higher density than to a point that has a lower density. And we're going to do that using the following rule, which is actually the Metropolis-Hastings method. It's known as the MH, the Metropolis-Hastings method. Who actually came up with this method 
is a little bit unclear, and why this is unclear probably has something to do with the fact that it was invented somewhere in the Manhattan Project in uh, Los Alamos uh, in, a, in an environment shrouded by secrecy. So the actual people who might have invented it might not have been able or willing to write a paper about it, which is why the original authorship is a little bit complicated. So even though the method is called Metropolis Hastings, it might actually be uh, due to the brothers Rosenblut and Edward Teller, who at least bought a paper about it in 1952. But we don't really know. It doesn't matter though, because they're quickly going to have much nicer algorithms. The way Metropolis Hastings works is as follows. We're going to draw, as before, our random number from the proposal distribution. For example, the proposal distribution might be a Gaussian distribution centered at the current location. I'm going to show you a picture of what this looks like in a moment, and then you'll see, or maybe get an intuitive picture of how this works. And then, when we're again going to evaluate this ratio between the probability at the point our proposal distribution says we might want to step to and the density where we are currently at, I'm actually going to multiply it with the ratio between these two quantities, which are a little bit complicated to say out loud. So that's the proposal distribution for, actually, in the, in the denominator, that's the proposal distribution for the proposed point given the current location. And we um, multiply the inverse of this with the, with the sort of inverted proposal distribution for the current point given where we currently are. So one way to think about this is, this is the probability down here to step where we want to step given that we're currently here. And up here, that's the probability that if we were currently where we are now thinking about going, we might step back to where we currently are. Why we need that ratio, we'll see in a moment. Let's just say it there. And then the algorithm is different now from before. We're not going to optimize and only accept that this ratio if it's larger than one. Instead, we're going to accept it whenever this ratio is larger than one. So every time this step goes upwards, we accept it. But if the ratio is less than one, then we actually accept it with a probability given by that ratio. So notice that this is a number um, that is lower bounded by zero, because these are all probabilities, so these are all numbers that are larger or equal than zero. We assume that um, these numbers in the denominator are never zero. Why? Because this we just assume by design, and this um, we assume, uh, I mean, sort of by design because we have drawn that number, so we, would, we wouldn't draw it if the probability is zero. And this um, is, not, is not going to happen if we design our Markov chain right, unless we start at a point that has zero probability, we should never move to a point that has zero probability. Okay, so um, I'll show you a picture now how this works. Before we do that, um, two quick things to sort of keep in mind. One interesting aspect here is that there is no rejection. It's not rejection something. No point is ever um, rejected. So if there is, well, I mean, a point might be rejected, but the Markov chain never um, stops. So there's always a time step that goes from t to t plus 1. However, what we might do is we might decide to put a copy of our current location into the Markov chain. So if this number is less than 1, and we now draw a uniform random number, and that uniform random number is uh, larger than a, then we, this point, this proposed point x prime, is not accepted and what that means is that the Markov chain steps forward by one step and we keep a copy of where we currently were into the next, or we move that into the next time step. This means we now have two at the same point in our Markov chain twice after this step. And this means that in the end, when we take all these samples and scramble them, this point will show up more frequently. And this will be necessary for the proof to work. Okay, well, the proof. It's going to be a simple argument for why this is. So how does this actually work in practice? I'm going to show you two different visualizations to um, give you a pictorial view on uh, how this algorithm works. I know that the, the next visualization I'm going to show you, which is designed to be very specific, sometimes confuses people, so I'm going to go slow. So let's say you want to use this Metropolis Hastings algorithm to draw from the black curve, which you see here, that's this sort of multi mode distribution, that's the thing we want to draw from. Of course, we don't really want to do this in 1D, but 1D plots are easy to make. The red curve is our proposal distribution. 
we assume that we use here a Gaussian distribution. I already told you in the previous lecture what a Gaussian distribution is. It's this bell-shaped curve. Now, one fun thing about Gaussian distributions is that they are symmetric around the mean, which means that, um, very specifically, the probability to move to this point, given that we're currently at this point, is equal to the probability that we're moving to this point, given that we're currently at this point. Which means that this ratio here is just one. So we can get rid of these terms, and we're left with these two terms in t that's not necessary for the algorithm to work, but it's nice because it simplifies the plot. Okay, so what, here's, what has just happened here is that we're currently at this point. That's our current location. We're currently at 3. And the proposal distribution has proposed to move to this location, 1 point, whatever, 1.1 1 .1 or so. Now what we're going to do is we evaluate the ratio between this number, so that's p tilde at x prime, and this number, which is p tilde at xt. And the way I do this is that I draw um, a horizontal line connecting these points and then draw a vertical bar from the uh, lower point to the upper point. Now, you see that this ratio is larger than 1 because this value is higher than this value. Great. So we're just going to accept this point. The rule is we move to this point. Okay, we do this. Now we move to this point. And what I do here uh, underneath is that I'm creating little black dots for all um, samples that are end up in the Markov chain. And I plot them at a height that is chosen uh, uniformly between 0 and the height of the black curve at that point. Why am I doing that? Because that means if the Markov chain works well, and asymptotically we produce samples that actually come from the true density, then if we run this process for a long time, we expect these black dots to be uniformly distributed in this area that is bounded by the black curve. Okay, so what happens next? So our proposal distribution, we're now here, has produced a new proposal. That proposal is to move to this point um, here. So now we take the ratio between this value, which I've got up here, and, sorry, that's proposed to move here, actually, to, to, to this point. I'm sorry, to this point, right? And that's very low. So the, pro pro the, pro the probability for this point to be accepted as a step, which is the ratio between this number and this number, and this you can read this off on this vertical bar here, it's this bit down here, that's very small. So the probability for this to be accepted is actually quite low. So now I've produced a random number, that's this golden dot, that is uniformly distributed on this region. And that dot is above, so that means this point will not be accepted. So what we do is we just add one more black dot at this location, again drawn at a uniform uh, uh, height between 0 and the height of this point. Okay, that's this point, we'll just move it over here. So um, let's do that. By the way, notice that the, um, the process here requires us at every time step to evaluate the value of the black curve. So this is not for free. Evaluating p, of course, is something that takes computational work. For well, this here, it's a very simple P, it's trivial work. For a complicated simulation model, this might be an expensive thing to do. Now, um, okay, so we've decided to stay at this point. We move forward in time. So now we, our proposal distribution produces a new random sample. It's over here. We take the ratio between this value and this value that is given by um, where this horizontal bar is on the vertical bar. We draw a random number. It's below the bar, so that means we accept this and we move to this point. And now, but I guess by now you might have understood how this works. We'll keep doing this for over longer and longer, and over time you see here the samples produced after I think something like 300 steps. Actually, it's up here, yeah, 300 steps. And you might um, sort of look at this picture, and maybe one thing you see is that's one of these points where I would probably ask you a question: What do you see about this plot? If you don't see it immediately, maybe stop the video here. Once you've stared at this picture for a while, you will see, maybe, that the distribution of black dots under this curve doesn't look entirely uniform. This is because after 300 steps, this Markov chain has not, we say, sufficiently mixed yet. So we actually haven't drawn IID uniform random IID variables that are distributed according to the black curve, which means that they would be that the black dots would be uniformly distributed across the area delineated by the black curve. And if you stare at this picture for longer, 
you might actually get an intuition for why the, the, the dots on this uh, picture are distributed the way they are due to how the Markov chain moves around. So you can, for example, see that there's a little bit of a, a massing of, pick, of dots here and maybe over here as well. And I'll let you figure out why this might be the case. So, um, actually, let's move two steps forward. I'll show you one more visualization of, actually, I can show you, I can show it to you now. I'll show you one more visualization how um, the Topolis Hastings works in a two-dimensional fashion. And for this, I'm going to use a visualization that wasn't created by me. It was created by a guy called, um, huh? go for what? What's going on? By a guy called uh, Chi Feng. He was, at least at the time that I currently can find the last uh, record of him on, on, online, was a student at MIT. I, uh, his, his code is available on GitHub. You can find the, uh, the, the link here. Um, it's a really great visualization of how Metropolis Hastings works, which is why I'm going to show it to you, even though I didn't write it myself. Um, he doesn't have a, a copyright statement I can find. I'm hoping he's fine with me showing this. I very much recommend to look at his GitHub page. There's lots of cool stuff on there. It's a great visualization, and we should use cool deductive tools if we have them, so let's do this. Here's what this looks like. What you're, I'm going to show you many of these, uh, this plot over and over again with different algorithms over the course of the lecture. What you're seeing here is a two-dimensional probability distribution. Here it is, it's a banana-shaped distribution. Actually, this nice visualization allows different distributions. I'm going to stick with this one. Here on the left and uh, bottom side, you see modular distributions, so projections of this thing, this distribution onto the walls. This is what they look like. And then you're going to see over time a histogram will appear of the samples. Well, we're going to use this um, um, Metropolis Hastings method. I'm just going to start a visualization and Started. And what you see here is the algorithm initially produced a sample over here. And now what happened is that it uses this proposal distribution, which is a Gaussian distribution actually. And um, every time you see one of these arrows showing up, the algorithm draws a sample and evaluates this metropolis Hastings ratio. If the arrow turns red, that means that the sample is not accepted, and then the algorithm picks more and more copies. And you can see, if it stays at one point, how the corresponding uh, bar histograms up here actually rise up, because the samples keep being added to the distribution. And every time the arrow turns green, then the probability to accept was uh, reached by the random sample, and the algorithm actually moves. So then you can see it moving. Um, forward and over time, I can I can actually speed up the simulation a little bit. I think, and now you see this algorithm move around, and you can see it populating this distribution as it moves along. And you can also see that this is, in some sense, an interesting process. It also has maybe a few flaws that we have to talk about. But before we talk about these flaws, let me first show you how people show that this is actually a good algorithm to use. And for that, I have to stop this method, reset it, and move forward. How do people show that this is an acceptable method to sample random numbers? They, um, the standard ma um, mathematical machinery to show that these algorithms work is to show two different properties of the Markov chain called detailed balance and ergodicity. These are actually not the necessary requirements for this method to work, but they are sufficient for it to work, and they are typically what people use to show that a certain market chain of the color method is a good idea. What we want to show is that the distribution of the samples from this Markov chain, so assuming that we have um, a, a probability distribution that fulfills here is a bit, uh, one of the regularity requirements, and then if we start at any arbitrary point in the um, support of the target distribution, then the distribution of XT, which is the marginal, like the asymptotic density of the samples from this Markov chain, approaches the target distribution uh, in the infinite limit. How do people show that? Well, they show two properties, which I said are called detail balance and ergodicity. I will if define these properties and directly show that the Robert Hastings fulfills them. Detail balance is the, the property given by this equation. This is the left hand side and this is the right hand side, which you could read as saying, so in capital T, with capital T, I mean the probability for the algorithm, not the proposal distribution. 
distribution, but the entire algorithm to move from a current location x to a new location x prime. Different balance means that the probability to be in one point under the target distribution and then move to the other point under the transition probability is equal to the probability to be at the other point and move from that other point to the current location. Let's not think about why this is the right thing to show, but let's first show that Metropolis Hastings fulfills this property. How do we show this? Well, we take, um, we just plug in the, this, what T actually is. T is the probability for the entire algorithm to make that step. So for that to happen, the proposal distribution has to propose this, this location, and then this location has to be accepted. The probability to accept that point is either one, if this ratio is larger than one, or if this ratio. So it's the minimum of one and this ratio, which lies between zero and uh, well, well, the minimum of this lies between zero and one. Now, um, what you can do is because this is a minimum, so the the um, the location of the minimum is not changed by a monotonic transformation, so by a multiplication by a positive number, which is which is why we can drag this number inside of the minimum. Um, so that means on here we just get this number, and here notice that these are the same terms, so these two cancel with each other, and now we have this on the right hand side, this on the left hand side of the minimum. And now we do the opposite thing, we drag that number out, so we take it outside of the minimum, which again we are allowed to do because this is a number that is larger than zero. And um, now we have here exactly the probability that we're looking for. So here we have an x prime. And this here is the probability, because the minimum is obviously symmetric, for the algorithm to, given that we are at x prime, propose x and then accept it. So Markov chains that have this property called detail balance have at least one stationary distribution, which means that asymptotically, if we draw many of these samples and look at the density of these samples, that density is given by this so-called stationary distribution. And this is not really a proof, this is just a sketch of how this works. To do this properly, of course, you have to make much more regularity assumptions. But uh, this is not a technical math lecture, this is not uh, your lecture on, on stochastics. Instead, I'm just going to show you roughly how this proof works. <coughs> Look at this. This is the, um, you know, what you would get if you assume that the current, that, that the algorithm produces samples that come from this distribution. And now take all of these samples everywhere. And now for each sample, apply the transition probability from x to whatever x prime is, and then integrate out all of these points that the algorithm might have a distribution over. So assume that you have a bunch of samples that come from this distribution, and then apply what the algorithm will do in a single step. That's a kind of a convolution, if you like, with this um, process. Then because of detailed balance, we can rewrite it like this. Notice that the integral is over x. So p of x prime doesn't depend on x. You can take it outside of the integral. And then notice that this here is a probability over, um, over x. right? It's the probability to move to x, given that we're currently at x prime. So probability is integrated to 1, so we're left with p of x prime. So what this means here is, intuitively speaking, if you imagine that the algorithm would, at some point, have that the distribution p, and then you apply, so if there are many, many, many samples, they all come from p, then you apply one step of the algorithm, then afterwards the samples still come from P. That's nice. Of course, it doesn't guarantee yet that the algorithm actually will reach this distribution. It just means that if it, one, if it is once in this, in this stationary distribution, it will then stay in this distribution. And it only, has, it only says that there is at least one such stationary distribution. To show that there is at most one stationary distribution and the algorithm actually reaches it, we require a, 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 the second property, which is called ergodicity. Ergodicity is an even more complicated uh, concept to, to define. It roughly, leaving out a bunch of sort of technical statements, amounts to the statement that's saying there's the sequence or Markov chain. Um, such a sequence is called ergodic if it is aperiodic. It doesn't contain a recurring sequence, so it doesn't go back and then start uh, creating recurrent sequences. And it has what's called positive recurrence, which means that if the, if the chain is at some point at x star, then there is a number t prime larger than t such that the probability to return to x star is larger than zero. So the chain has a non-trivial probability of or non-zero probability of returning to uh, returning to where it ever was. But if it does that, there is it's um, impossible 
for I mean, no, sorry, it's not possible, but the probability for this to happen over and over again is not one. Metropolis Hastings is a body if we draw random numbers. It's, you, this is not a proof, but you can say intuitively thinking, why is this the case? Well, because we are using random numbers to decide our, our step. So therefore, we, can, we, we know that if we, if we, if we ret return to one point that we've, met, we've uh, been at before, then the probability to now restart that cycle and do it over again is zero. Ergodic Markov chains have at most one stationary distribution. I'm just stating that. This is not a proof, um, because it's actually quite tricky to do that. So Metropolis Hastings, therefore, has at least one stationary distribution, and at most one stationary distribution. And therefore, if I'm leaving out a little bit of technical detail, it actually approaches the stationary distribution over time. So this means if we have a proposal distribution that is non-zero at um, all uh, at, on the, sort of the entire support of P, then for any starting point x0 in this domain, the density of these samples for extremely long runs of this chain approaches P. Now, this means that we are sort of allowed to use this method because over time it reaches the distribution we're looking for. It doesn't say, though, that this algorithm is um, going to converge with the rate that we introduced in the last lecture from the Carl methods. And what I mean by that is actually better, easiest shown in uh, two visualizations. For the first one, I will return to this beautiful code by T. Feng, and I'll run this again, this fast thing. And now one thing you can note, what we do here actually, is change the width of the proposal distribution. So how do you, I, I sort of glanced over the fact that we need to come up with this distribution here, which is here, a Gaussian, actually. And a Gaussian has a parameter, that's the width of this distribution. How do I set this distribution? Well, you have to set the parameter, right, the width. So let's say we make it very small, that's here. Now, the distribution is very small, and what happens is, you can see every time the algorithm proposes a allocation, it's almost always accepted. <clears throat> the reason for that, the reason for this is that locally, if you have a very small proposal, proposal distribution, the target distribution is locally almost constant, right? It's well approximated because this is a smooth distribution. Now, it will accept this point, and what you can see is that this Markov chain is now moving relatively slowly. It is actually performing what is known as a random walk. Random walks have, um, maybe you know, some of the annoying properties, which is that the rate at which this algorithm moves away from any particular point is proportional only to the square root of the number of samples rather than linearly to the number of samples. So maybe you could say one way to fix that is just to make the distribution much broader, right? So let's say I do that, then what happens is that the algorithm will typically get stuck for very long times, right? So almost every sample we propose now is going to be outside of the main support of this distribution and therefore won't get accepted. So now the algorithm will keep adding more and more and more points to one single location before it moves. And this means, of course, that um, even though every time it moves, it now makes a larger step, the time between steps is much uh, reduced. So how should we choose the correct step size for this algorithm? Well, one intuition is that locally this, or maybe sort of in some sense, this distribution has two different length scales, if you like. It has a long length scale that is basically the width of this picture. That's called that capital L. And it also has a short length scale, which is maybe the width of this banana, which let's call that epsilon. And then how to set this proposal distribution and how the algorithm moves depends on both epsilon and L. To get a good acceptance rate, we have to set the, length, the width of the proposal distribution to something like epsilon. So this is maybe like this, roughly speaking. Then the algorithm is going to accept a, um, a high proportion of, of uh, locations, but then it's going to go into something that is similar to a random walk, as you can currently see. What is that going to, to understand what that's going to mean for our algorithm? I am going to stop this and move forward one slide and show you this picture again. So here's a pictorial view of what happens. Imagine this is a simple distribution. Uh, this plot is uh, inspired by another uh, plot that is in David Bukai's book. I made it myself, but a similar plot is in David Bukai's book. And this is a Gaussian distribution, so a distribution that's actually very easy to draw from, but again, we use it for diagnostics. It's a very, very strongly correlated distribution, so it's very thin. 
The black dots are actual draws from this distribution, which are possible to draw in ghost form for this simple distribution. And the red dots are the Topolis Hastings samples. So the chain has started up here, and then it has moved down here and started this random walk behavior. So as I just said, this is actually quite a typical situation for general practical situations, because in real-world inference other problems, of course, you don't know as much about the distribution you're trying to draw from. At very best, you have a very rough idea of what the width of the distribution is. You use a circular proportional distribution, a Gaussian, because you don't know much else, and the true distribution is non, has a non-linear shape anyway. Um, let's say the problem has d dimensions, and there is a large length scale L, which in this case is this long line from here to here, so that's about one the length scale here. It has a small length scale, it's called epsilon, which here is about 0.1, roughly speaking. Now, to get reasonable acceptance rate, we have to set the width of the proposal distribution roughly to a small length scale, otherwise almost everything is going to be rejected, because in high dimensions, remember, we have this problem of high rejection rate, in a high dimensional space. Otherwise, our acceptance rate is going to be exponentially suppressed by D. We haven't even seen much of this in our two-dimensional pictures so far. So if we take the, this, the, the width of a proposal distribution to be epsilon, then the, the, the acceptance rate will be on the order of one, so it will be OK. But the, um, the topolis Hastings algorithm will then do this random walk that I just showed you. And random walks have the property that their expected square distance traveled, their variance over the number of samples, because they are essentially sums over IID random variables, behaves like the Monte Carlo estimate, so they scale with, so the variance scales linearly with the number of steps, which means that the um, expected distance traveled, which is the square root of this, is equal to the square root of the variance, so the variance is epsilon squared times t. So this is epsilon times the square root of, sorry, the acceptance rate times the, so the, the number of steps taken. Well, the number of steps taken is the number of steps times the, the acceptance rate, because if, if, R, if you don't accept, then we don't move. Right? So um, this is the expected distance travel, which means we want this algorithm to travel along the whole distance from here to here to get one independent sample, right? So you can intuitively think of the time it takes to get essentially one independent sample, or the time for the Markov chain to mix, to move back and forth between all of the regions covered by, the, by this distribution, is capital L. So if we plug capital L here on the left-hand side of this equation, and then rearrange, we find that the time it takes to make this step, to draw one independent sample, scales like uh, one over the acceptance rate, which is maybe okay, because we've chosen R such that it's on the order of one times the ratio between the large and the small scale squared. So for a Gaussian, this here is essentially the condition number on, the, on uh, the matrix, for those of you who understand this already, which defines the um, equipotential lines of this quadratic function. Squared, which is bad, because in, in real life, this ratio might already be a large number, and now we take the square of it, which makes it an even larger number. So this algorithm is kind of smart, and I mean, it's 50 years old, so it's pretty cool that it has this property. It's very general, you can apply it to, uh, you know, it doesn't require you to have a global description, but it has these flaws, and we kind of have to fix this over the course of the rest of this lecture. Here's another picture. This is the uh, experiment I showed you in the previous lecture, we're trying to estimate pi. I've shown you the black line before. This is exact samples from the real distribution. We know that this Monte Carlo estimate converges like the square root of the number of samples. Here is this plot again in black. This is the one over square root convergence rate. We already argued that that was maybe not so great, but at least it gives a good ballpark estimate relatively quickly. The trouble is Hastings is going to be worse than that because its convergence rate is lower bounded by this good behavior of the left line, right? Of this well, questionably good behavior of the left line. At the very best, this algorithm actually draws exact samples, but in, on, in reality, it won't. It'll do it. It'll draw exact samples with the rate given by one over the acceptance rate times the length scale ratio squared. So um, for this very simple two-dimensional problem for estimating pi, you can see that even if you want to have just a ballpark so if you just want to have an error that is less than 1, roughly, then you might have to wait something like 2 orders of magnitude longer, something like 100 times longer for the algorithm to reach for Monte Carlo, for Monte Carlo 
to uh, get to this point, then you would have to wait, which is already a long time, for the exact sample. And this is just a two-dimensional problem. In higher dimensions, the issue might be much, much worse. So that's our long-awaited first gray uh, slide. Monte Carlo methods, in practice, are usually Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are able to deal with probability distributions that are only known, or their, whose PDFs are only known after normalization, even if we don't have a global representation of this distribution, by using a local proposal distribution that only requires local operations. It requires us to evaluate P or P tilde in the vicinity of where we currently are, and they produce a Markov chain which over time asymptotically approaches the true distribution. These methods converge at best as fast as exact sampling, and in the naive fashion I just showed you, they might still have a relatively bad mixing time. So the multiple we have to take to get to the, uh, to get the kind of convergence rate might be very high, especially in high dimensional. So to address this, we'll have to build better methods. Here you can take a quick break to think about this problem and then we will return. All right, in the meantime, I've noticed that the camera was recording from the wrong microphone. So now the audio quality should be a little bit better. Apologies for that. Okay, we've built our very first Markov chain Monte Carlo method, Metropolis Hastings. It's a half a century old method that is Nice in the sense that it is generic, we can apply it to relatively general distributions. We only need to be able to evaluate P, the target distribution, up to normalization, so only P tilde, at a, in a local region around where we are currently at. We have noticed that there is this mixing problem which we need to address. So we have to deal with this, ex with, so on the one hand we have to choose the proposal distribution such that the acceptance rate is relatively high but at the same time, when we do so, the algorithm tends to go into a diffusion. One way to address this issue to some degree that is actually in certain applications still a very efficient algorithm is known as Gibbs sampling. And it's given by the following abstract form, which is a bit complicated to describe, so I'm going to show you a visualization in a moment once I've introduced how the algorithm works. The idea is, if we're drawing from a multivariate distribution, so from a distribution that has, where the x has multiple indices, which is usually the case, then there are often situations, this arises in particular applications, of which we will see some later on in the course, that the um, probability distributions, the conditional distribution for the ith dimension, the ith entry of the variable, and that entry might actually not just be a scalar entry, it could even be a subset of the entries of, of um, x at time t, that that conditional distribution, given all the other indices of the variable at the moment, so this means we're currently at some location in the input space, and if we now reason about only one or a subset of the dimensions of x in that, at, at this location, so basically we cut through the distribution at the point we're currently at, then that distribution is often one that can be analytically captured, from which we can draw efficiently. Either because, and you can already imagine when that would be the case, that variable becomes conditionally independent of some other subset of the variables when we are conditioning in this way. Or, in the most extreme case, in the more general case, because the ith element is just a univariate distribution, so maybe in univariate problems we can use simple things like rejection sampling to actually build reasonably efficient sampling algorithms. Now, um, Gibbs sampling works in the way that we keep doing this and we just basically sample these elements dimension-wise, one after the other. So we take basically axis-aligned steps within the coordinate system to draw our samples. I'm going to um, represent this in notation by using this delta, which is known as the Dirac distribution. It's a very awkward kind of object conceptually because it's a, dist a probability distribution that doesn't have a measure and it doesn't have a density. Um, therefore, 
but um, it's really just a notational tool that is very handy to describe what we're going to do. So this object is supposed to be um, a probability distribution that essentially just means we're keeping these values constant. So the probability to draw from the proposal distribution a new location x prime given xt is going to be that we keep all the other variables that aren't i, so that by that I use backslash i, which is everything other than i, we're just going to keep those constant, which means that the entries in x t plus 1 without i are just going to be the ones from x t multiplied by a probability to just draw the i-th element of this next step given the value of all the other elements. If this is confusing, I'll show you in a, pic a picture in a moment. Then um, the uh, probability, well, for, for that which we need to evaluate for the target distribution at this x prime is just going to be the probability for the i-th element given all the other ones times the marginal for all the other ones. That's just the product rule, right? That's just a fundamental property of probability distributions. So, um, which is in particular true at location t. So, if we now do this, if we use this as a proposal distribution for the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, then we can find that this will have acceptance rate 1. So this process will always take that step. Why is this the case? Well, you can actually just do this simply by looking at the form of the, uh, of the acceptance probability for Metropolis Hastings. So here it is again. This is just copied over from previous slides. And now our proposal distribution is going to be this thing up here. And our uh, target distribution is given by the fact that we can write the target distribution as a conditional of the one entry in x t that we care about, number i, given all the other ones. So we plug in for this probability at the proposal distribution this factorization, which works, just to remind you, for every i because of the product rule. And then for the proposal distribution, so x prime given x t, we use this form, which is this notation, notational trick that just means we're keeping all the other entries constant and proposing to draw just one more uh, entry x i. Now notice that here a bunch of terms cancel. So this term is in the numerator and denominator, so it cancels. And this term is in the numerator and denominator, so it cancels. So we're left with this expression. And if you think about this for a moment, then what is this down here? So that's the probability for the i-th element given that all the other entries in non-i are given by xt. And, um, um, yeah, and we keep them constant. So this is actually exactly the proposal distribution for the other direction which we need um, sort of up here, which shows up up here in the acceptance probability. So that's the probability to be at x prime and um, have all the other entries being equal to xt and propose a step that goes to x um, t i. So that probability is just one. So therefore, this algorithm is always going to accept. And this idea, Gibbs sampling, is a way of getting rid of this issue that we need to find a proposal distribution that scales in the right way around the distribution to not get very low acceptance rate. So basically, we have to guarantee one way to think about this process is that it finds a perfectly scaled proposal distribution, which has acceptance probability one. The only price we pay for this is that we now need to do the updates axis aligned rather than doing them jointly as all of the variables in one. And what that means, I'll show you again on this visualization by, um, whoop, um, by Chi Feng. Here's the code again. Now I've switched the sampler to Gibbs sampling, and it's the same distribution as before. And what you're going to see, as I, if I keep run this, is the algorithm taking an entire Gibbs step. So every time it does this, it proposes here two different variables by taking first a step in one direction along this axis, and then proposing a step in the other direction of the axis. And you can see that these are always axis aligned steps. 
And there's always a green arrow because they're always accepted because the acceptance rate is one. Now you see that this is a relatively smart algorithm. It's exploring relatively quickly. The nice thing about this is that it always has the entire dimension to choose from by, because it takes an exact step in along the axis. And you can also see maybe what the problem here is. So one advantage is that there's no degree of freedom here. There's no parameter to choose, right? This, this is just an exact algorithm. It's still a Markov chain Monte Carlo method though. So it still has a Markov chain that has to mix. And you can see why this is a problem now that the algorithm has reached these tails. That first, that it takes quite a long time to get to these tails because if you're up here, then if you draw along this direction, the probability to move very far down here is almost zero. So therefore, the next step, which would then draw along this axis, that could take us down here, very rarely happens. So the algorithm has to slowly kind of diffuse its way down in this direction. And then once it's down here, it's sort of stuck in the other way, that it now has to be in one of these two tails. And in these tails, it can't move up in this direction much. So you see that this algorithm nevertheless mixes much better than Metropolis Hastings in this setting, because at least it's, taking, it's accepting every single step and the marginal distributions are not that bad. So actually this marginal distribution is covered relatively well now after a bunch of samples. Um, this one is not quite there yet. I need to run the algorithm for longer. So this is actually not that bad, but there are um, of course also settings in which this method is particularly inefficient. So for yourself, if you want to stop the video here for a moment, try and think of a situation in which this method is not going to work particularly well. In case you've stopped and thought about it, when is it not going to work well? It's not going to work well if the distribution we're trying to sample from is really not axis aligned. So if it looks something like this, an elongated thing, then the algorithm is going to take very bad local steps. And one way to get Gibbs sampling to work well is to make sure you set up the sampler such that these conditional proposal distributions are actually relatively well axis aligned. So let me stop this. Oops, it's not stopped. And go back and tell you that this is one efficient way to build a good algorithm. It's not always great. So if you have a distribution that is like this, it's not, a, not an ideal algorithm, can actually work relatively badly. But it is actually a method that for models that have this conditional independent structure or that have structure under which these proposal distributions are quite good, can actually work really well. And later on in the course, when we talk about more structured probabilistic models, we will encounter situations where this method actually suggests itself because of the structure of the model. Now for the remainder of this lecture, I want to try and get us as close as possible to the actual state of the art in this part of probabilistic machine learning. And to do so, fair warning, I'm going to deliberately introduce a few things that at least at first sight are probably going to seem a little bit over the top for you in terms of their mathematical depth. This is a deliberate step in this lecture. I know that some of the stuff I'm going to show you will seem too fast and maybe too deep. I'm still trying to do that because one of the goals of this course is to empower you not just to use standard techniques but to develop your own algorithms. You're master students of machine learning, you're supposed to become experts and an expert has to be able to build their own solutions rather than to just use existing tools. And to, you, to do that, you have to understand how the existing tools work. You cannot just always use a toolbox without understanding how the individual elements of the toolbox work. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to get every little detail of the derivation. You just have to get an intuition for what's actually going on here. We are going to talk about an algorithm that is clearly among the state of the art, or at least it's the basis for the state of the art in parts of probabilistic machine learning, a Monte Carlo method that like Gibbs sampling ensures that the acceptance rate of Metropolis Hastings is always one. So we saw how to do that in Gibbs sampling by choosing the proposal distribution in a particular way, but um, if you look at this expression and think about what you could do to get this number to be one so that every step is accepted, then you might notice that one way to get to this is to set these two probabilities, so the probability of the point we step to and the probability of the point that we come from, to be equal to each other. 
and the assume a symmetric um, sort of reversible, if you like, proposal distribution. Now, doing so would um, seem to require us to restrict the proposal distribution very extremely such that we move along equipotential lines of the, probability, of the probability distribution. And that, of course, doesn't satisfy the requirements we've seen for the proofs uh, for Metropolis Hastings to work on previous slides. But there is an ingenious trick that is based on the rules of probability. So remember that, we, that the axioms of probability include the sum rule, which essentially tells us that if there are additional variables in our model, latent variables, that we can integrate or sum these out and get marginal distributions. Now the trick we're going to use here is to sort of invert this process and instead invent latent quantities, additional ones, which are not normally part of our model, such that um, we can ensure the acceptance probability to be one of Metropolis Hastings, and still make sure that the marginal density over the quantities we actually care about is the one we're trying to sample from so that our proposal distribution has actually full support in these variables on everything we want. And the way to do this is associated with the name of William Hamilton, an Irish physicist who made great contributions to theoretical physics. Among them, he was one of the first physicists to suggest the idea of conserved quantities and conservation laws to describe the laws of physics. He was not alone with that, but his name is sort of associated with this issue, uh, similar to maybe Helmholtz, depending on what your uh, national allegiance is. So, um, you don't need to know much about physics to understand how this works. If you do know a little bit about high school physics, there is a nice motivation that arises from Hamilton that um, gives this algorithm its name. And it's an algorithm that is designed to be used on probability distributions that have the following form. They can be written as, uh, so our p of x that we care about can be written as, or this could be a lowercase p maybe, um, some normalization constant times an exponential of some function which we will, we will call minus e. So such probability distributions are called Boltzmann distributions and later in the course I will talk at more, in more depth about um, the class of distributions that can be written in this way. For the moment you can think for yourself well that this is probably a very generic class because notice that um, the exponential just maps to um, numbers larger than uh, zero, right? So uh, if you have distributions that are on some domain non-zero and you can guess that that's a lot of distributions then there's always going to be, in some sense, a uh, function e that allows us to write a distribution like this. Of course, there are corner cases, and we will have to talk about those later on in the course. But for the time being, we just need to notice that this is a very generic class of distributions you might care about. And of course, it's also very easy to get e. You just take the logarithm of p, right, up to normalization. This e uh, is, a, is a suggestive name. It's called the energy um, of the system. And this is motivated by the theory of thermodynamics that Hamilton made contributions to, but you don't have to know much about this. So the idea is going to be that we will introduce a new variable. We are trying to draw from a distribution over x, the variable x. We're going to introduce a new variable, which we will call p. And p is going to be, um, actually it could be a number of, it could be any kind of um, latent variable that we're going to use in a, in a certain way that I'm going to talk about. But the typical interpretation is that you can, that uh, you should think about p as the time derivative of x. So time derivative meaning, I've actually defined it down here, d, um, so x dot means dx dt, and we're going to call this variable p. And now we're going to define a quantity which is called the Hamiltonian in physics as well, which is, has, um, and the important algebraic property is that it's a sum of two terms where each, where the first term is E, and so it, therefore it only depends on X, and the second term is some other function that only depends on P rather than on X. The physical interpretation, if you like that, is that this is a potential energy and this is a kinetic energy. So kinetic energy depends on velocity and the time derivative of a location is the velocity. And um, so if there are physicists in the room, you know that there's a mass missing here. Let's just assume the mass is one. And um, 
the energy only depends on the location, not on the, the potential energy only depends on the location, not on the velocity. So that's your high school level physics interpretation. And um, now we define uh, the kinetic energy, for example, to be the square of the uh, momentum. Now, actually, we don't need to ensure that P, that, that the, the, the kinetic energy has exactly this form, or in fact that, and this is sort of related to this, that P is exactly equal to the momentum. There is a more, like what we really just need is two components. The first one is that um, we need this uh, Hamiltonian to be a sum structure. Why that's going to be relevant, we'll see in a moment. And secondly, we need to impose some structure on the dynamics of this system. So on the time derivative that our Markov chain is going to produce as a function of x and p, such that this quantity h is conserved in time. Why? Because this conservation law is going to ensure that our acceptance rate of the Markov chain is going to be 1. And the factorization property, so the sum structure in here, is going to ensure that it's going to be easy to compute the marginal distribution over x. Because what we're going to do is we're going to um, simulate the dynamics of um, some dynamical system that operates on x and p such that h is time conserved and then run essentially Monte Carlo on this and then uh, consider the probability distribution that is given by the Boltzmann distribution up to normalization that is given by e to the minus this function h. Now, um, because of this factorization property, the marginal distribution over x is going to be easy to compute because e to the sum of something is just product of e to the constituent terms of the sum. And because each of these are probability distributions, we can integrate out p, the other variable, the marginal, and just get, um, because this term only depends on p and this term only depends on x, it's easy to do this marginal. If you write an integral around this and integrate about, around p, then, you, then this term just pops out and this term just integrates to 1. If it doesn't integrate to 1, it integrates to a, to a constant which we can absorb into the normalization constant. And because this E will be conserved, we'll find that, the, uh, that Metropolis Hastings will have acceptance rate 1. We'll see that in a moment. So what are the dynamics we need to do? We need to impose to ensure that this is a conserved quantity. Well, they are given by these coupled to differential equations. These are called the Hamiltonian dynamics. And they are, if um, you know about these terms, ordinary differential equations. So what I've written down here is, I said, the time derivative of x, so time being the index over which our Markov chain samples. Um, so this is just a simple notation that is common in physics, that is the partial derivative of x with respect to t, is, um, should be given by the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to this momentum parameter p. And the time derivative of p, which is this, should be minus the derivative of h, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. Why is this the dynamics we need? Well, because this conserves h. To do that, we need to do a little bit of multivariate calculus. So the, the total derivative, so the derivative of this Hamiltonian function h that depends on p and x with respect to t is, by the chain rule, dh dx plus dx dt plus dh dp times dp dt. Okay? So that's standard multivariate calculus. And now we plug in the the, the properties of the xdt and the pdt, which are x dot and p dot, from our sort of required dynamics. Um, and you notice that these two terms are just the same. Why are they the same? Because products commute. Um, so this term is equal to this, and that means the time derivative is zero, which means this function does not change over time. And therefore, our acceptance probability of, so here I've, I've just copied over the term from uh, uh, previous slides. Now, um, actually, now we're going to simulate from a Markov chain, or we're going to draw from a Markov chain, which where, for a dynamical system where the time ev evolution of the variable p and the variable x is given by the Hamiltonian dynamics. And therefore, the, um, and this is sort of, this is wrong. I should write that down here. Oh, there's a pen. This 
if we now do um, Metropolis Hastings essentially with a proposal distribution that is given by a Q that simulates from the dynamics of this system, then our acceptance probability is going to be P of, and here I should introduce the variables Px and um, sort of little p for the momentum overload of notation divided by p for probability over x prime and momentum prime times the proposal distribution, so q of xp given x prime p prime divided by q of x prime p prime divided by xp. Now, if the dynamics of our dynamical system are what's called time reversible, so the probability to move from one state to the next is equal to the probability to move in the other direction, um, and that is true for this dynamical system, then this cancels out and we're left with um, conserved quantities which, um, so because this p is e to the h, right? Up to normalization. Because this doesn't change in time, this factor is one and this algorithm is always going to accept. So this is uh, maybe, maybe what's the next best thing to do. So um, actually, okay, I should may maybe com com conclude the mathematical confusion by saying how are we going to produce our proposal distribution Q that draws from this dynamical system? How does this work? Well, to do so, we need to solve a differential equation that is defined by these Hamiltonian dynamics. And to do so, there are mathematical tools that do that, and they are called numerical algorithms, simulation methods. So we could go into deeper detail and talk about how these methods actually work. This is an entire lecture course for itself called numerical analysis. We're not going to do that, but I want to show you just one slide to give an intuition for how this works. These methods, so we need an algorithm that draws from, uh, sorry, that, that simulates the dynamics of a system defined in X and P, such that the time derivative of, this, uh, of uh, these two variables, X and P, is given by these um, uh, two partial derivatives. Then um, to solve this, we need to essentially find a curve, F, that satisfies these kind of uh, quantities that are described by the differential equation and there are algorithms that do that. And we're not going to talk about how they work but I just want to know you, I want you to know that these are actually relatively simple methods that recursively evaluate this function f which is here given by um, whoop, by these dynamics of the, uh, of, by the Hamiltonian dynamics but um, they evaluate this and then recursively construct an estimate for what the solution of this curve is. Actually, this process is quite related to what a machine learning method does. There is an unknown quantity, the solution of the differential equation, which gets, which um, um, is sort of connected to a quantity you can observe, and that's the value of this function f at various points. And you now have to actively decide where to evaluate f such that over that such that the, the numbers of f you construct and how you do how you do sort of estimation from them, let's not call it inference, just estimation, actually um, give an, a curve estimate that is in some sense good, that is somehow close to the true solution. Now it turns out that there are methods that look like that, that do this, and um, here is an implementation of it. Um, this, is, this is actual Python code. This is the entire Monte Carlo method. This is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. It's, um, so uh, this is um, a, a, a method that starts with an initial sample and then um, augments the, um, the parameter space with a, at each time step with a momentum that is drawn in such a way that the Markov chain is reversible and then evaluates both the, um, the energy function of, the, that's our P of X we want to draw from, and the gradient of the energy function so that we can compute our momentum. And then in here, there is a little ODE solver, a, a solver for differential equations that just keeps iterating um, for over several steps. So this is a, a for loop here to estimate the solution of the differential equation forward in time. What you, do have, you don't have to understand what exactly is happening here. 
what you have to understand is that this is very simple code. I'm not calling any advanced um, uh, sort of package in here, right? It's just four lines of Python to do that. This is typically the takeaway I want you to get in the, when I show you code, that these, um, if you're using a software package, there's a danger that you get a feeling that there's some magic happening inside of the, of the package. In fact, what most software packages actually do is that they implement a relatively simple mathematical function or a relatively simple algorithm, or a relatively simple process, like in this case. So even though you've heard, oh, ordinary differential equation needs to be solved, this is actually a very simple process. It's just a for loop that updates, as you can see, very elementary objects um, with each other, and then um, does uh, a, uh, essentially a proposal. So if this, so this ODE solver were a perfect method, if it were actually, like, it actually could simulate from the from the dynamics of the of the of the the, um, the Hamiltonian dynamics, then this would always accept this Markov chain Monte Carlo method. However, we're using this numerical method to estimate what the solution of this ordinary differential equation is. So therefore, this acceptance probability is not exactly going to be one. It's going to be ever so slightly off. And this step here is essentially the metropolis hastings step, which guards against problems arising from that. Um, instead of uh, showing you much more of this code, let me instead um, move forward and show you another, another piece of code from, oops, um, from uh, Chi Feng. So now we can use whoop, the Hamiltonian reset, and I'm going to, we're going to start here. And what you are seeing, I'll just let it run, I'll move it, let it run a little bit slowly, is the uh, is individual steps of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So in every single step, the algorithm is currently at some point. So that's our Markov chain starting somewhere. And then this chain of points you see of black dots is the um, evolution of the dynamical system. So that's a solution of this differential equation, or it's actually, it's an algorithm trying to estimate the solution of this differential equation, which itself is an approximation to the true solution. And then once it has run for a certain while, it uh, evaluates the acceptance probability, which, as you can see, is always one, because that's or it's not quite one, it's sort of close to one, but it's so close to one that actually almost all, and so far, all of the steps of this method are accepted. So with that, this is a beautiful, um, uh, essentially numerical method to produce samples, and you can see that it's, in some sense, much smarter than the Gibbs sampling method we've seen before, and certainly much smarter than uh, standard Metropolis Hastings, because it ensures that the system explores along the, um, the, the shape of the distribution we're trying to draw from by simulating essentially a massive particle that is rolling around in this potential, and because it has constant energy, it'll um, eventually reach every single point. Now, I can... Um, maybe speed this up a little bit so you can see that it's sort of moving efficiently around. And in this sort of dynamics, it is exploring the entire shape of the distribution and adapts to the geometry of this, um, of this distribution. So this is actually very close to the state of the art. There's only two annoying aspects of this algorithm that you might still want to fix. Um, before you uh, sort of lean back exhausted and uh, think, okay, well, that's as good as it's gonna get. And those two problems are that this algorithm has three parameters. And these are essentially the three parameters of this solving a differential equation part. One of them is an, um, an actual quantity that is a problem in the modeling. We have to decide for how long to solve the differential equation. So we need to say what one time step actually is. So how far is the simulator supposed to run? And the other question is what the uh, what, what the quality of the, of the ODE solver actually should be. That's the step length of the solver. And you can see that this is a problem if I actually let this algorithm run for longer, then you can see that what happens quite often is, so now the algorithm is exploring really well across the domain. This is maybe a good choice for this particular problem. But if I now increase the step size, because these are, I mean, this method is clearly doing a little bit too much, ah, okay, so let's take the step size a little bit shorter. Then you can see 
what the algorithm does is that it often um, starts simulating and then I've I sort of inefficiently chosen the length of the simulation relative to the overall geometry of the problem so that uh, typically the simulation at some point turns around and uh, returns almost like much closer to where it started than, it, than um, uh, the maximum distance it has traveled at some point. So in fact, there are choices of the step size that are even worse that often get us basically back to where we just started. This behavior um, is uh, in current literature called a U-turn of, of this sampler because it basically that's what it is, right? You can see it move back and forward. And now, this essentially just means to fix this kind of issue, we need to find smart ways to choose the parameters of this algorithm, the step size and the time that we're going to simulate. And this is, in fact, um, a very general problem with any numerical method. So this is something, if you haven't, don't have much ex experience with numerical methods, you should know that this always happens with any kind of computational tool. There's always going to be some hyperparameters that you somehow have to set, and you don't have to set it manually, like in this setting, you want to have a smart algorithm that does that for you. And you will invariably find many papers by smart people who've thought about how to do this and they've come up with beautiful solutions. One of them for this particular setting is called the no U-turn sampler, also abbreviated as NUTS. Um, it's an algorithm that is now almost six years old already, so it's not maybe not totally state of the art. It's quite close to state of the art though. It was published by uh, Matt Hoffman and Andrew Gelman um, in uh, New York and um, it works like this. Here is actually, it's actually in here. Let's use this one, um, a smart implementation of this method. This is an algorithm that the very basic idea is it just runs in, it just runs the Markov chain in two directions. So it cre creates a momentum and then also inverts the momentum and runs the simulation in both directions and basically tracks statistics of how far these two chains are traveling before their distance mutual to each other starts decreasing again. So before they basically turn around and start getting back to each other. And then it takes one of those two sides and uh, decides to take that simulation. Of course, all of this has to be done with care so that detailed balance and ergodicity are still satisfied. And if you want to know why that's the case, you can read the original paper. I don't want you to get that deep into the algorithmic development. I just want you to understand that this is the level of care that is required to build good probabilistic um, algorithms or probabilistic inference algorithms. So I'm just going to run this maybe for a few more um, steps. Actually, not this. That's the wrong thing to change. I want to change the, this. And you can, now you can see this algorithm run efficiently to explore and move around in the input space. This kind of method is one of the state-of-the-art um, algorithms. The, um, before I go to the, to the final slide, I should tell you that, um, of course, you do not really have to implement this kind of algorithm yourself if you want to use it in practice. Like other parts of machine learning, in the past few years, also probabilistic inference has become a domain of computer science in which we see more and more standardized software packages. And there are available software packages for you that allow you to use these kind of methods to draw from probability distributions. And I don't want to advertise any of them. I just want to show you a few. Well, that basically amounts to advertising them, I guess. Um, one package that you might have heard all, all about before already is called PyMC. This is an open source Python package that um, Im implements various Monte Carlo methods. And it also includes, of course, methods like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and uh, its variants that adapt step sizes. These, this is a specific tool just for sampling, but these Monte Carlo methods are also a key part of the notion of probabilistic programming that we're going to talk about more over the course of this course. Um, and there are entire packages that allow this kind of notion of efficiently defining a probabilistic model and then running inference on it. One which is quite popular with practitioners is called STAN. In fact, um, you know, U-turn sampler was probably invented to make STAN work. Um, one way to describe STAN is that it's probabilistic inference with a no U-turn sampler. And um, if you want to have a look, do so. Just Google or just go to mcstan.org. Another more recent package that I also don't want to, to uh, promote or so, but just, um, you know, just to actually realize that there are several such packages is called um, uh, Pyro. It's um, developed uh, as an open source package, mostly by Uber. 
And Pyro is a general package for probabilistic programming that also includes a module for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And so here's the, the, the doc page for it. This is a, a generic way to implement a Monte Carlo method and then you have to define a kernel. So you have to decide which Monte Carlo method to use. And there are a few to choose from, um, mostly HMC, which is short for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And um, where is it? Whoop. And NUTS, which is this no U-turn sampler, which as I said is a variant of uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So I wanted to show you these software packages because there is a perception in some parts of the sort of uh, further away from the core of the community that only deep learning is, is uh, the only domain that has these beautiful software tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on. That's not true. There are many cool software packages for probabilistic inference as well. These are just a few that I just wanted to highlight. There are many more. And in fact, this is a very lively field of scientific development and in uh, maybe by next year when you when I might do this course again I might have to update these slides because by then there might already have been uh, be a new cool software package that automates probabilistic inference. So what we've done today is we've seen that Monte Carlo methods are a generic way of solving integrals in the naive fashion they converge um, with one over the square root of the number of samples to an unbiased estimate this is very good um, but it's hard to implement in practice how to actually draw these samples if you want to do this efficiently. Therefore, there are approximate methods called Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which consist only of local computations which break unbiasedness, but produce a sequence of samples such that over time, if you let the chain run for a very long time and then um, scramble the samples, you hope to get samples that are actually IID distributed and come asymptotically drawn from the correct target distribution. We haven't talked about how to diagnose that that's the case or not. Um, that will come at a later point as well. Um, these methods are, um, uh, have the, well, they, the, one thing to, that's important maybe to understand is that Doing, building these, these Markov chain Monte Carlo methods is itself actually a task you have to understand well. It's not entirely automated, but there are processes that help you automate this, uh, this design process. In particular, there are certain families of Monte Carlo methods that are generically applicable. Among them are a Gibbs sampling. Well, Gibbs sampling is reasonably generic. It's, it's particularly efficient for for probability distributions which have interesting conditional independence structure so that you can pr uh, this design these axis aligned proposal distributions efficiently. And then there are methods like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which work on generic smooth distributions to, by simulating dynamics from an expanded variable set that includes the, one, the sample vari variables you want to sample from and additional variables, additional variables which, are, which the algorithm basically keeps track of and then marginalizes out for you. These algorithms are currently among the state of the art they um, require careful parameter tuning, but there are beautiful algorithms to do so. And um, of course, the, I, I've showed you Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is not the only Markov chain Monte Carlo method that is state of the art. There are other ones out there. Uh, the notion of sequential Monte Carlo is also very important. We don't have time to talk about that today. What I wanted you to get out of this is if you need to draw, if you need to do probabilistic inference, you need to solve integrals. To do so, you can use Monte Carlo methods. You need to find, use good Monte Carlo methods because otherwise your Monte Carlo method might not work well at all. These good methods require a little bit of understanding of what's going on and they are available in software packages. So you don't have to implement them yourself, but if you know what they do, this can help you build really efficient implementations that need way, way, way less samples. This is important because Monte Carlo methods, even if they are exact, so if they are not as approximate like Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, at the very best, converge like one over the square root of the number of samples. So stochastically, if you like. And to make Markov chain Monte Carlo get close to this already maybe demanding, computationally demanding performance, you need to know a little bit about how to design the Markov chain well and how to structure and set hyperparameters. The takeaway from this for you maybe is that actually doing probabilistic inference remains quite challenging if you want to do it generically. 
Maybe that's worrisome, but then if you think about how hard it is to get a deep learning model to work, maybe it's okay if at, uh, this beautiful framework that allows reasoning with uncertainty and encoding uh, structured prior information requires a little bit of hard work as well. The reason why it's so hard is that we're trying to solve an integral, and integrals are just fundamentally a hard task that after centuries of research, quite in contrast to differentiation, its opposite, is still an unsolved problem. With that, I want to briefly remind you that there is a new exercise to look at today, and it's actually the second version, the second week of the project you started in the past week to build a battleships agent, an agent that can play this tabletop game. This week, we're going to move from a single ship on the board to multiple ships on the board, and actually try to build an agent that plays this game against a human or against another agent. And to do so, you will have to think carefully about how to address the combinatorial explosion of complexity that arises if you have multiple ships, ships on the board, and how to implement the resulting inference efficiently. Maybe you might get to use some of the Monte Carlo methods we've spoken about today when trying to solve this exercise. I hope you have fun with that exercise, and thank you very much for your time.